Hey, welcome back to The Health Bridge. Dr. Patrick Shojai here with Dr. Josh Axe, who um, I've known for years, and uh, he's been on the cutting edge of a lot of things. Uh, his latest book, awesome. Great title called Eat Dirt, and he's talking about intestinal permeability and uh, the microbiome and leaky gut syndrome and all the kinds of things that we've circled around in the show here. Uh, he has a really comprehensive uh, book on the subject, and it's just it's a fascinating read, and it's a good read. Uh, Dr. Axe, welcome to the show. Hey, Pedro. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's always great, man. So you're in uh, Nashville, and uh, you know we were just kind of talking offline about how you've slowed down your travel a little bit. You know, you and I, you know, health guys traveling more than we should. You know, sometimes it gets a little out of hand, and you know when we get um, ahead of ourselves, uh, we're not immune to anything either. So. Uh, you know, I just recently had some of that where I just I pulled off gluten and dairy, um, and I was feeling pretty good. And then I had a little bit of gluten, and it was just like, oh, right? Yeah. It's just your body reminds you, like, hey, dude, I should know. Yeah, yeah. You know, similar thing. I know that for me, it's um, you know, I practice what I preach. I eat really healthy. I work out all the time, and. Uh, but, you know, we, we still have our own problems. And, you know, a lot of what I teach is through personal experience. You know, even, you know, I, I tell a story in the book about my mom and how sick she was with leaky gut and cancer and a number of things and how she got well with the principles I teach in the book. But even myself, you know, I actually struggled with uh, leaky gut as a doctor. In fact, coming out of school, I lived in a moldy home uh, down in, in Naples, Florida when I was doing an internship before I went into my own clinical practice and uh, started developing all of these different health issues, uh, including leaky gut and, um, and other, a lot of other health issues. And so um, really a, a lot of the book is about how I recovered myself even when I was a doctor. You, you know, it's always hard when you're a physician and you're uh, trying to teach patients uh, about something you're struggling with yourself. But at the same time, that's really what I feel like has made me more of an expert in digestive health because I had to overcome it myself and then have used that over the years to help you know patients do the same. Yeah, it's kind of a, the easiest way to learn, right, is having to wor workshop it in your own life. But uh, it's not, not always the funnest way to learn. Um, so let's, let's just define this for people who don't know what leaky gut is. Just what, what is leaky gut and, and you know, how, how are we looking at this? Sure. Well, you know, leaky gut uh, is what I believe to what Hippocrates was for, referring to over 2,000 years ago when he says all disease begins in the gut. And leaky gut is when you get uh, essentially gates of your intestines stay open when they should be closed. Or another analogy people like to use is essentially like your gut is a net. Uh, it's essentially your gut lining is a barrier in between your intestines and your bloodstream. And so what happens is you have little small holes in your net that allow certain things to pass through into the bloodstream that are smaller. What happens in leaky gut, those small holes become larger. Essentially, you get a tear in the net. Things start passing into the bloodstream that should never pass pass in there. Uh, undigested food particles and proteins such as gluten and casein. Um, toxins, certain types of uh, pathogenic bacteria, these things leak into the bloodstream and your body then says, hey, th these shouldn't be here, sets off an immune response causing inflammation. And if that continues to happen over time, that's where something like leaky gut can even lead to uh, autoimmune disease where your body starts attacking its own tissues. So where let's say your th certain thyroid tissue or, or, or joint tissue starts looking like the gluten it's attacking all the time. And so, you know, uh, essentially leaky gut is, um, you know, inflammation of your intestines that calls the, causes these holes. And then what, what it can lead to is a number of health conditions based on where people are susceptible. So it can lead to things like uh, arthritis. It can lead to food sensitivities, malabsorption, so people aren't digesting foods properly, uh, thyroid conditions. So it, it can really lead to uh, a number of health problems. Yeah, and we're seeing those all over the place. And so how, how hard is it to get this diagnosed? Can you kind of detect it yourself? Like, how do you know you have leaky gut? You know, I think for most people, Peter, they can simply um, look at their own symptoms and realize that they have a leaky gut. And I'll talk about a few of those, but there are tests as well. I think if, if somebody has multiple food sensitivities, that's a definite warning sign. All the conditions I met, uh, mentioned before, such as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, arthritis, any type of, if you have autoimmune disease, I think it's an absolute, you have leaky gut. Um, if you've got bloating and, and gas and digestive symptoms, that is, 
inflammatory bowel disease is a you know very severe form or later form of if you have intestinal inflammation a lot over time. So I think with symptoms, those are some of the big ones. But then there are tests such as uh, the lactulose breath test as well as zonulin test. Those are absolute indicators that you have leaky gut. But then, you know, some other things can tell you as well. Oftentimes, if you get a what's called an organic acid test or a micronutrient test testing for vitamin mineral deficiencies, if you're not, if you have low levels of B12 or zinc or iron, those are typical warning signs that you have leaky gut if you have that malabsorption or digesting properly. If you get a stool test and you see that you've got uh, dysbiosis or imbalance, too much bad bacteria, not enough good, that's another warning sign. You know, so, so, and then food sensitivities. Again, if there are a lot of food sensitivities someone is having all the time, your body's constantly reacting. I really think all of those are warning signs that people have leaky gut. But the absolute test to know for sure medical test is a lactulose breast test and a zonulin test. So a lot of people who, you know, we talk about food sensitivities, they go, well, I don't know, I don't have that. But I get exhausted after meals, you know, I get moody after meals, I get brain fog after meals. You know, let, let's look at the kind of the, the gamut of this in terms of like where people are at on, the, on this kind of continuum of leaky gut. Because, you know, uh, anything other than feeling charged after a meal probably means that there's something not necessarily working there. Yeah, you know, I'll say this. I think for a lot of people that um, actually even mentioning leaky gut, leaky gut is, it's almost an unfortunate name because people hear that and they tend to think, Leaky gut, that sounds like maybe a really severe form of a loose stool or, or something like that. I mean, I, when people first hear that, I think they would tend to say, well, I definitely don't have that. The right. truth is somebody, somebody can have leaky gut and have really no digestive systems. But jumping back to your question about food sensitivities or someone saying, oh, I don't have a food intolerance or I don't have leaky gut or anything like that, um, I think you're right is that we tend to just say today that we don't have that or we doubt it, but you really don't know until you have a test. An IgG test is a very easy test to do to find out if you have it, but I think ultimately, you know, you can know a lot of this without ever getting a blood or saliva or a urine test. You can know by how you feel. I mean, that, that is the ultimate indicator in many cases is how you're feeling. And listen, if you're not feeling great, if you, uh, you know, uh, suffer from fatigue or weight gain or pain in your body, any of those things, those are warning signs that something you're eating isn't agreeing with you. And so, um, you know, there are lots of food sensitivities out there, but I'd say, you know, once you eat, really listen to your body, uh, you know, for the next two to three hours after a meal, and that's a big indicator. And for some people, I mean, some reactions can happen much later, they can happen a day later, but really, again, listen to your body. A lot of people feel bloated, a lot of people have digestive distress, you know, about two hours after a meal, and so really paying attention to your body, listening to your body to see how, you know, how different things are affecting you. Um, you know, it's a good thing to do. But if not, again, you can do an IgG test. It's pretty inexpensive. Um, and, you know, you can go to a holistic doctor in your area or you can order it online. That's one of the crazy things, Peter. It's like you can go to Great Plains Laboratories online and you can get a t- test kit shipped to your house. And a lot of it's either just a blood spot or your analysis. You ship it back and you have your results in, mm-hmm. uh, you know, one to two weeks. And so, you know, again, there's, there's some pretty easy ways to tell. So we go through all this effort and we find out that, you know, lo and behold, we do have this thing called leaky gut, which is a terrible, terrible name, by the way. I agree with you. Um, So then the title of your book is Eat Dirt. Um, What do we do about this? I mean, are we literally eating dirt? Like, how how do we then start to resolve this this kind of complex condition that's leading to all all this malaise? Sure. Well, you know, I think that um, my, my book, in terms of the title, uh, serves several benefits. One, it's true that I do in ways teach people to eat dirt. But yeah, I'm not telling telling everyone here who's watching they should go up in their backyard with a you know with a shovel and literally just eat clumps of dirt. It really has more to do with. Um, our lifestyle and what we're doing on a daily basis. And I use sort of different examples of eating dirt. But, you know, I'll give you my, my, uh, I was reading actually a study online and they were talking about how 
when you go and buy carrots at your farmer's market, and, and even after you wash them off, you'll notice that it's not this glistening orange carrots. Are There's still sort of these little brown specks embedded in the carrot. Well, those are called SBOs or soil-based organisms, and they're uh, probiotics from the earth. And uh, they don't live in your system, but they pass through your system, and they serve a purpose of killing off pathogenic bacteria. They've been shown to help. Um, you know, create different vitamins and minerals in your body. So there's a lot of benefits of these SBOs, uh, as well as breaking down the food you're eating. So there was a study fi- that found that these soil-based organisms actually helped you break down and digest polysaccharides and starches in your food. And there was another great study out of Japan, and they found that uh, people in Japan digest seaweed better than people do in uh, in the Americas. And they said it was because they were consistently eating it on a daily basis. Some of those microbes took residence in their gut. So anytime they ate seaweed, their body was better prepared. In fact, the scientist, the lead researcher said that their body was equipped with better utensils in the future to actually break down and actually digest seaweed. And so the truth is, this is why eating local is so great. When you're eating local, whether it be seaweed, if you, if you live in Japan from your local region, or the foods that are growing and soil near you, you've been exposed to microbes from that region that actually help you break down those foods. And so specifically in Eat Dirt, one of the stories I tell is I walk in the uh, my uh, kitchen, I was visiting my parents down in Florida, and my mom was just, my mom did this as a kid, like she would, uh, we'd get potatoes and carrots and she would make us, we would scrub them with a scratch pad until like there was no skin on them. You know, they had to be totally clean. And my mom was doing the same thing. And I said, mom, I said, just, just stop. I said, just Eat some dirt. I said, it's good for you. You probably need a, I said, you need a little dirt in your diet. And again, from the research is showing that it's beneficial. There's another great, uh, uh, some research done on a tribe called the Yanomami tribe. And this tribe was found to be, uh, have the healthiest and most diverse gut bacteria in the entire world. And they found on a regular basis, they were eating things like uh, crickets. They ate venison, they eat fish, they eat a lot of vegetables and plantains and things like that. But also, they said they believe that they have the highest level of gut bacteria in part because they would notice they ate a little bit of dirt just because they didn't wash out, you know, scrub and rinse all the food they had. And one of the other things here in Eat Dirt I really get into is talking about this, uh, the, the age of antibiotics we live in and really how we've sort of toasted our gut bacteria and the side effects because we've become a society that's really too clean. And not to say, I mean, proper sanitation has saved millions and millions of lives, but we've actually taken in ways sanitation too far in the other direction with all of these different antibacterial things today, which actually harm and destroy a lot of the good microbes and and bacteria in our gut. In the old days, like Jesus was born in a manger kind of thing, right? Like we had a lot more exposure to bacteria. I mean, I got two dogs at home. My kids are constantly being bombarded by like, you know, dirt from the outside. And uh, I think that there's something to differentiate. You know, for me, our rule at the house is if you're going to go in the front yard where there's like streets and cars and car tires, you got to wear shoes. I don't like my kids touching anything. Backyard, no holds barred, right? Because we have our own garden, we have our own soil, and it's just so petroleum-based dirt isn't the same as bacteria and soil that comes from like, you know, the good healthy bacteria around. And so getting that kind of exposure uh, actually is turning out to be better for our kids. It's better for our health. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point, and these are a few things I touch on in the book. But there, there, you know, there are some great studies showing that children that live on farms have more robust immune systems. There's a great study on pets. In fact, they found uh, that children who had dogs had a 52 percent less incidences of asthma and allergies than kids that don't have pets and cats, 48 percent less. And so, you know, if you have just just pets in your house, it actually strengthens your immune system. And they found that it was because that sort of pollen and those microbes that are on your dog, you know, in their fur, that you're when you're hugging them, when you're petting them, you're getting those more what are called micro exposures. And in the book, I refer to them as both micro exposures and and natural immunization. You know, today when hear when people hear words like vaccine and immunization, it brings up a big debate. But what's not really um, talked about oftentimes is we have these sort of unnatural immunizations that are given today. But a lot of people don't talk about the benefits of natural immunizations today. In a ways, having a dog is a natural immunization. In fact, eating raw local honey is a natural immunization. You know, I 
I, um, you know, I, I had wondered about that for, you know, when I first heard that and went and did research and started finding that within raw local honey, there are over 200 local microbes. And when people tend to get allergies, a lot of times they'll start consuming honey once they get the allergy. In truth, the benefit comes from consuming a teaspoon of, and it doesn't have to be just raw honey. I mean, there are other local things you can do. But using that as the example, if you're doing a teaspoon or so of raw local honey that's loaded with pollen from your local area every day, your body is building up this natural immunity and tolerance and some of them residing in your body. Then in the spring and fall, when that onslaught of pollen comes on, your body's used to it. It's immune to it, you know, kind of like, and I'm a big fan of the Princess Bride, you know, when the Sicilian uh, and the... Uh, you know, main character sort of immunizes themselves. And I'll give you another example of this. My in-laws just went on their 30th wedding anniversary to Cancun, and they did not drink any of the water there because they would have gotten sick. But all the locals there were drinking water. They were totally fine with the water. Well, that's because they've built up an immunization. They built up a tolerance to those bacteria or those microbes in their area. And so again, a lot of us just have not built up our systems with a good micro exposure. So here are the ways I recommend that people get some micro exposures. I'll touch on a few and there are a lot more in the book, but one of the big ones is again, having a pet. Another one is just getting outside. I mean, I love what you said with your kids, just outdoors walking barefoot. So many people refer to it as earthing or grounding, but just getting, you know, and and then gardening would be another one, just getting your hands and feet in the earth earth and dirt are great exposures, swimming in the ocean or a natural lake, spring-fed lake. In fact, the largest body of viruses in the entire world, good viruses, they're actually called bacteriophages, are located in the ocean. In fact, many people think the ocean is healing because the salt water, and it is, but it's not just the salt. It's actually a lot of the microbes in there can benefit your health as well. And so again, those are just some of the, and then of course, eating you know food from your local farmer's market, rather than buying those baby carrots that have been peeled and sprayed with that chlorinated solution to where they're shining, glistening, and actually may in fact damage some bacteria in your gut. Doing some of those carrots that still have those brown specks on them, eating those, I mean, that, that's all nourishing these microbes in your gut. So those are, those are some of the ways that I, I you know, teach people how to eat dirt. Amazing. So how do we offset the influences of the bad stuff? <clears throat> we have triclosan, we have you know, antibacterial everything out there. And you know, I'd say a you know, good, good percentage of our food now is also uh, kind of laden with antibiotics. So how, how do you offset the damage? If you're doing all this good stuff on the front end, you still have to have some sort of defense, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I would say there's really two two key points here. One thing is start to avoid all of these really strong antimicrobials. You know, when you're doing those, uh, you know, the triclosan, the hand sanitizer, some of the hand soaps and things like that. You know, if you look at studies, hot water kills off 99.9% of even pathogenic bacteria. So really, if you're just doing hot water, that's typically all you need. Or do something more gentle. This is where I'm actually a huge fan of essential oils. I I love using those. And so like my wife is always carrying just a little bit of lavender in her purse. Um, You know, a lot of times she'll also carry some just tea tree oil. But, you know, tea tree oil with some water, you know, if you're traveling, that's what my wife and I do. If we go and use a public restroom, I I don't teach people to not never wash their hands. I teach people to not not use the chemicals that are going to cause more problems. And so we use, you know, some hot water and just to drop a tea tree oil, rub that on our hands. And that's, that's a natural replacement. So I'd say number one, start switching off of a lot of those chemicals and those, and those antibiotics that um, can be more harsh on your body and your digestive system. And the second thing would be really build up these microbes. Number one is with the environmental and soil-based organisms that we talked about. Uh, at, at, at an earlier age in life, and again, this doesn't apply to, to most people who are listening right now, but you know, they're even finding, obviously, uh, you know, being born naturally uh, rather than C-section or through a vaginal birth is most beneficial. But even if not, there are doctors now that are recommending that you know uh, doctors go or you as a parent take those vaginal secre- secretions in a cloth and actually wiping those on the baby so they actually get those exposure early on. Breast milk, you know, breastfed babies really helps educate their immune system. And if you're a mom who can't breastfeed, you can actually buy breast milk online or for somebody. It's an investment. But these are just some things to think about. And then in general for the average person, it's getting 
more of these microbes uh, or probiotics on a daily basis. So considering if you do well with dairy, doing a goat's milk kefir or yogurt can be great. Uh, fermented vegetables such as sauerkraut and kimchi, um, doing things like kombucha, Fermented, uh, you know, Japanese uh, foods such as miso is, is fantastic. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways, but really getting more of these probiotics in your diet, and then in supplement form, look for a supplement that contains both those soil-based organisms as well as food-based probiotics, like Lactobacillus plantarum is a great one. It's uh, the main probiotic found in things like sauerkraut. But I'd say taking a good probiotic supplement. Uh, getting um, probiotics in foods on a daily basis, and then really avoiding those harsh, chemically-based antibiotics are, are some keys. So you, uh, you've laid out a five-step program to actually repair leaky gut in your book. I'd love for you to walk us through that. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I think, I think number one um, uh, really comes down to um, – avoiding, as I said, the antibiotics. And, and Peter, I, I was reading a study published in the Journal of American Medical Association, and I don't think a lot of people realize how harsh and, and, and strong our prescription antibiotics are today and a lot of the medications we're taking. You know, the study actually found that those who take one round of antibiotics in a year, it increases the risk of cancer by 50%. And I don't say that to scare people. It's just to say, well, how could that happen? How could you know, taking an antibiotic increases your risk of cancer. Well, we got to remember 70% or more of your immune system is located in your gut. And so really our gut has to be healthy, robust, working properly. And part of your gut immunity is the good guys, those probiotics that line your gut. So again, I think these harsh antibiotics in the book, I talk about gut grenades and I actually refer to antibiotics as the A-bomb, such as atomic bomb, because it is that damaging to gut bacteria. I mean, I, I've, in clinical practice over the years, I took care of so many kids that came in, and they had multiple food sensitivities, uh, learning disorders, a number of issues. And a bit, and the parents would say a big part of it started when their kids took prescription antibiotics for a common ear infection or a cold. So antibiotics and staying away from those are a big no-no. You know, replace them. If you need to do something that's antimicrobial, you know, do something like an herb, you know, an herbal compound such as Paldarco or oregano or grapeseed extract. Do that and take probiotics at the same time. Do that as a combo. That's a better option. And then also staying away from these other uh, antibiotics. You already mentioned this earlier. It was a fantastic point with the hand sanitizers and, and chemical there, personal care products. So many of the personal care products that men and women are using on a daily basis contain chemicals. The other thing would be the water we're drinking on a daily basis. Uh, tap water contains fluoride and chlorine, and fluoride has been proven to be an antibiotic killer. So step one would be start removing some of these chemicals. Household cleaners is another one. You know, replace those with things that are essential oil based, things like that. I would say step number one. Step number two, diet wise is, um, you know, remove those foods we talked about, but especially foods that are going to cause intestinal inflammation. The big ones would be, one is sugar. You know, sugar will feed yeast. And by the way, I'm not a person that next necessarily says zero sugar, all sugar is evil. I think sugar in the right context is, uh, is, uh, is healthy, such as, you know, a little bit of sugar that's in blueberries or carrots or that type of thing. Most of us are getting way too much. The issue that we run into with our bodies is even if you've got a healthy system, if you're doing too much sugar, it, it overfeeds certain or certain microbes such as yeast. And so you start to get yeast overgrowth, candida overgrowth in the body. They prefer sugar where other types of microorganisms may prefer something like a soluble fiber uh, that's found in something like a chia seed or a you know, or, or, or certain vegetables and things like that. So again, diet wise, I'd say stay away from processed sugar, stay away from the hydrogenated oils, and also stay away from all of these vegetable oils. You know, a lot of times people are going out and buying healthy chips today that where we're using sunflower and safflower oil, most of those have been deep fried or heated to a point where these omega-6 fats now, it's very high in omega-6, they're very rancid. And so even things labeled health food today, oftentimes with all the sunflower oil, aren't necessarily good for us either. And, uh, you know, and also trying to go gluten-free. If you're going to consume grains, consume ancient grains that have been 
uh, germinated, sprouted, or lacto-fermented. It's going to be much easier on your body. And then from a food standpoint, the best foods for supporting and healing leaky gut include number one is bone broth. I know it's probably been overset at this point. I know we hear about bone broth all the time. But I want to give you a few facts about bone broth that you may not have known or thought about. <laughs> I really believe bone broth is what I call the missing protein or contains the missing amino acids that we have. Um, if you think about this with athletes, now in Chinese medicine, uh, it's very prevalent that eating a tissue of a certain animal supports that tissue in your body. So for instance, in Chinese medicine, if somebody is having liver issues, they actually recommend that they eat liver. Or if somebody is having uh, joint or ligament issues, they'll recommend that they eat those tissues. And so for most of us today, we eat a lot of meat, right? We eat chicken, we eat beef, we're getting a lot of these types of proteins. Well, how many people today get muscle tears? It's very rare, isn't it? I mean, most people aren't getting muscular tears. How many people today, though, are having joint and ligament issues, issues with their tendons, issues with their ligaments? I mean, think about professional athletes. I mean, here and there, someone will pull a hamstring, but for the most part, we're getting a lot of joint and ligament issues, and that's because we have all of these proteins because we eat – I mean, we overconsume meat all the time versus – broth or bone broth, that's where you're actually getting the amino acids and minerals and other nutrients that are found in the ligaments and tendons and bones. And so bone broth is very high in collagen. We're very low in type 1, type 2, type 3 collagen. Type 1 and 3 collagen support healthy skin, hair, and nails. Type 2 collagen supports your gut tissue and your joints. Also, bone broth is loaded with glucosamine, chondroitin, and hyaluronic acid. In fact, we recently tested some bone broth. In fact, it had shocking amounts of glucosamine and chondroitin. I mean, higher than most supplements that you take today. And so these help healthy tissues and ligaments. Also, bone broth is really high in potassium. And so most of us need more potassium. And selenium is another one bone broth is high. And so, so all of these are things. And actually, calcium, magnesium, so many women today having issues with their bones later on in life. So again, bone broth is the most healing for the gut because it contains amino acids, proline, and glutamine as well. And also, it contains glycine, which supports liver detox. So again, long story short, number one healing food when it comes to leaky gut is going to be bone broth. Number two is going to be fermented vegetables. You know, things like sauerkraut and kimchi. Those really not only help probiotics directly because they contain probiotics, they also help your stomach get to the right pH so you can better break down and digest other foods, including proteins. Number three would be wild caught fish like salmon, foods high in omega-3 fatty acids like EPA, DHA, getting more omega-3s from salmon, wild caught fish, Flax seeds, chia seeds, walnuts are fantastic. Number four food would be other probiotic-rich foods such as kefir, like goat's milk kefir, coconut kefir. Other foods like that are fantastic. And number five would be antioxidant-rich fruits. In fact, there's studies showing that resveratrol and flavonoids and different antioxidants found in things like blueberries actually help support the growth of probiotics in your gut as well. So again, and, and they're full of good fiber. So again, berries would be the next on the list there as well as other fruits. And so again, that, those are the best foods. And the number four step would be I really would recommend um, people consider certain supplements. And so in terms of supplements, I believe that doing a bone broth protein powder or a collagen powder can be very beneficial for the gut lining. Again, I think probiotics, finding a, a, a probiotic that has probably over 50 billion units, one that has organic ingredients, one that's high in both soil-based and food-based probiotics. Number three would be if you already have major digestive issues, digestive enzymes can be very helpful for some people as you're initially overcoming leaky gut syndrome. And then actually frankincense contains boswellia can be very beneficial. And then, you know, and then there's L-glutamine powder. L-glutamine can be good. And last but not least, lifestyle. You know, one of the things that I've really committed uh, to the past three years has been learning Chinese medicine. And this is really a huge thing as well, even earlier on, that helped my own recovery from gut issues and teaching others. I could talk about this for a long time. I'll keep it short. But our emotions are tied to the specific organ dysfunctions we experience. And I'll give you an example. In Chinese medicine, there's something called five elements of Chinese medicine. And when you look at something like liver issues in Chinese medicine, they believe that if you're – and you can actually be a liver type or what's called a wood element type. 
And if you are a person that you're, the emotions you experience when you come into confrontation tend to be impatience, frustration, and anger, those three emotions all cause liver and gallbladder toxicity. So it causes stress on those organs in your body. And think about that. Think about how true that is. If you have somebody that's an angry drunk, we know that alcohol affects the liver, right? Well, vice versa, if alcohol, drinking too much can cause anger over time, you know, too much anger over time can cause liver issues. And they believe a similar thing with many other issues in the body. If you are, if you've ever been, so sometimes if somebody gets frightened to where they are totally scared, they'll pee themselves. Well, why is that? Well, if you experience fear on a regular basis, it's very hard on your bladder, your kidneys, and your adrenal glands. So people that were, think about a bear chasing you, they talk about your fight or flight response and adrenal fatigue. Well, that, um, those emotions of fear essentially, and, and what we label as fear might be your fear of financial debt, your, uh, your uh, fear of someone leaving you. Um, all of those things can, we can have fear from, that affects your adrenal glands. And so again, and I could go on and on, I mean, you know, in terms of many of these other things. In fact, if you experience a lot of grief, uh, or depression, if you've lost a loved one or been through a divorce or you've had an emotional traumatic experience, that tends to actually affect the lungs and the colon, which are the chief areas of your immune system. And so, you know, one of the things I teach in my book as well are the five gut types. And this is based off of Chinese medicine and my own clinical experience and really going through lifestyle because, you know, everybody, Peter, I mean, you hear the same thing. It's everybody wants the pill. Everybody wants, what's the supplement I can take for leaky gut? Supplements can support your body, but taking care of diets and emotions, emotions are 50% of it. I mean, really experiencing healthy emotions, I think, are really important. So just a few tips there in terms of lifestyle. I teach people to do a spiritual triathlon every day. That's where you spend the first five more uh, five minutes in the morning just practicing gratefulness, saying everything you're grateful for, getting your mind right. Number two, spending some time reading uh, something spiritual, whether it's a personal growth book or a Bible or, or a devotional, whatever it is, whatever sort of spiritual trend you follow, something like that. And then the last five minutes in meditation or prayer. So a spiritual triathlon is something I practice and I teach in the book. I also teach how to take a healing bath. That's with uh, like 20 drops of lavender oil and some Epsom salts help in healing the body. And I've got a lot of other tips there uh, in the book as well. But again, I think lifestyle, getting proper sleep and practicing proper emotional healing is really crucial for healing leaky gut as well. I love that. I love that. So uh, we're running out of time and I want to make sure we, we talk about this because uh, one of the things that I really like about what you're doing is you're also including recipes. I think people are really, you know, it's really easy to say, okay, do this and then not actually leave tangible um, examples of what to do and how to be, kind of piece this food together. Uh, because there's also a million and one things that have kind of breached the city walls and are inside the house already, uh, from the cosmetic items to the household cleaning items and all these other things that are kind of impacting uh, all the stuff that we're talking about. So. You have a pretty comprehensive list of what to look for and then what to kind of put into your, your food. So I'd love to just kind of talk about that for a moment. Yeah, so yeah, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk about recipes a little bit and, and you know, maybe practically some things you can do for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I mean, a lot of times people talk about smoothies and uh, for breakfast, and I really think it's a great thing to do uh, in the morning for breakfast. And let me kind of touch on the five food groups you should eat and the ones to stay away from. You know, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but again, uh, number one is vegetables, you know, especially cooked vegetables. You don't actually want to do much raw vegetables with leaky gut. You want to do a lot of cooked vegetables because they're easier to digest. Number two is fruit, specifically berries. Also, actually, kiwi and uh, some tropical fruits are good because they contain certain enzymes that support digestion. Number three would be wild caught meat such as uh, you know, wild caught fish, grass fed beef, organic chicken and turkey. Number three is going to be uh, probiotic rich uh, foods, especially things like kefir. And number five is going to be sprouted seeds or sprouted lacto fermented ancient grains. And typically, I don't recommend grains on stage one, but I, I don't think villain like, grains are villainous like everyone else. I think that 98% of grains are because of what we've done to them, but if they're prepared properly, they can have tremendous benefits. And so those are really the five food groups you want to stick with and everything else just don't eat it and so for breakfast doing a berry smoothie you know blueberries one cup 
doing a tablespoon or two of flax or chia seeds, doing some coconut milk, and then adding in either collagen protein or bone broth protein, adding those into a smoothie. And you can do some herbs like a little bit of cinnamon or ginger, some stevia if you want to use a sweetener or a little bit of raw local honey. But doing a superfood smoothie for breakfast is fantastic. And then I, the ideal meal to heal your gut is doing a bone broth soup in your crock pot. So you can either bo- buy bone broth in liquid form or make it yourself. It's really easy. It takes water and and chicken bone or and beef bones or, or chicken tissue. You make it for 24 to 48 hours, just simmer it, and then you've got your broth. And then adding in a lot of veggies there, you know, carrots, celery, onions. But a bone broth soup, if someone said to me, Dr. Axe, I, I want to heal leaky gut quickly. What do I do? Pretty much what you do is you eat bone broth soup for every meal both or a smoothie and then for lunch and dinner do bone broth soup for those two meals and that really is the fastest way and in Chinese medicine they actually call it the one pot and in Chinese medicine they teach you about food combining but they say when you cook all of these foods together in a crock pot for let's say 10 to 12 hours, those foods actually become one and it's easier for your digestive tract because they've been cooked over a long period of time. But also essentially all of it, all the foods have sort of melded together and your body, it's just, it's easier for your body. So again, doing a bone broth soup is the absolute ideal healing food when it, when it comes to, to healing leaky gut. And I've actually got a lot of great recipes for this. Uh, as well. There are great recipes in my book, Eat Dirt, and I've got great recipes on a new book you can find online. It's called um, uh, the, um, <laughs> the Gut Repair Cookbook. Sorry, ju- I, we just, we just pr- I printed it, just got it up. It's the Gut Repair Cookbook. And I just got a lot of free recipes on my site. If you visit drx.com and look up bone broth, I actually have a video to show you how to make it. I've got different recipes there for, for gut healing recipes as well. Love it, love it. The book is called Eat Dirt by Dr. Josh Axe. Um, and man, it, it's important stuff. Uh, you know, it's one thing to hear about. It's another thing to actually do it and like implement it in your life, which is the hard part. You know, we all read things. We all, you know, we all know probiotics are good, but what the heck are we doing about them is the question. And so, you know, this is a practical guide to doing it. So, uh, highly recommend it. Uh, Eat Dirt, Dr. Josh Axe. Um, Doc, thanks for being on the show. I think you're awesome. Thanks, Peter. Hey, thanks for having me. It's an honor. Thank you. Awesome. I'll see you next week.